Hey everyone, and welcome back to the show. I can't tell you how excited I am to announce our guest today, Alina Trigub. Alina, thank you so much for being here. Jada, it's my pleasure. Great, great to be here. Awesome. So everyone, Alina joined the TF Management Group LLC team in February of 2021. Alina spearheads marketing and investor relations, as well as educational activities. Alina's expertise has been built upon her personal journey as an equity investor, as well as through SAMO Financial, the company she founded and built to provide education and alternative investment options to her clients. Alina is also a very well-known speaker in the space. We're so glad to have you here. Why don't you start us off with telling us how you, where you were before you got into real estate and then what drew you into the space? Sure, thank you, Soja. I appreciate the introduction and absolutely. So my journey began almost 30 years ago when my mom and I immigrated to this country. And um, as a poor immigrant, I was deciding on where to go to college, what kind of career to get. And someone said, uh, hey, you're good with numbers, so you'll be good in accounting. And I followed that advice widely, mainly because I knew um, accounting accountants were in demand. Um, and after trying uh, to be a tax accountant in public and then in private world, they realized that accounting was not for me. So I left the accounting field and went into the information technology where I spent uh, 20 years and had a pretty successful career. But while working in the technology world and doing a variety of things, um, I still had a background of a tax accountant and I always was thinking about taxes because mainly mine and my husband um, tax brackets were growing as our careers were growing and I was always looking for ways to lower the tax impacts and during that journey and research real estate kept coming up and I, I kept saying to myself that I have to start investing in real estate because it seems to be the only way to lower taxes and so finally I took action about eight years ago, started doing my research. Um, I wanted to find something locally where we live, which is in New Jersey, but New Jersey being a very high tax state and high prices, uh, um, I was not able to find anything that uh, would make the numbers work for us. So I decided to look out of state. And while researching various out of state strategies, I came across the world of syndications and I, um, after checking it out, reading about this, I realized that this was a viable strategy uh, for our family. So I decided to take action and start investing. So when I found the first deal, um, it, it was hard wrenching to make that decision to invest in the very first project because uh, you know it was, it meant investing a large sum of money. It was 50,000. It was and still is a large sum of money um, with someone I've never met before in a place I've never seen in real life other than Google Earth um, and doing it virtually. So it was uh, definitely extremely stressful experience. But um, I did additional research. I did the due diligence that I thought uh, I should do at the time. And finally, uh, pulled the trigger, invested. And let me tell you, after that, there was this snowball effect, if you will. I started investing in a second and third and fourth and so forth. And I've invested in a whole bunch of syndications after that. And then after doing it and sharing my experience with my colleagues at work at the time and my friends who a lot of them are working at Wall Street because we're very close to the city. Um, I realized that most people have never heard of syndication. So I decided to start my own company, which was Samo Financial, um, with that purpose of helping other people essentially follow my footsteps and be able to um, diversify their portfolio completely outside of Wall Street, build this passive income, save on taxes, and um, have, a, a, you know, to create the wealth for for the generations to come. And I, while I was building Samo Financial, um, a mutual friend of mine um, introduced me to um, uh, my current partner, Mike Zlotnik, 
who uh, is the uh, fund manager for TF Management Group. And after talking to Mike, we realized that both of us uh, had what each other needed and we decided to um, partner up and join each other forces. So I joined TF Management Group um, and now Spear had uh, investor relations and marketing for the team. But that's where I'm at today. Awesome. That's a really awesome story, Alina, and there's so much there. I'd love to circle back on one aspect of the beginning of your journey, which was when you were looking at syndications and found out about them, how did they compare um, with the other real estate opportunities you were looking at, like potentially maybe some, some turnkey rentals or whatever it is that you were else you were looking at? Sure, sure. Such a great question. Um, I was looking at a small residential two to four units Maltese in New Jersey at the time. And uh, again, I, I kept evaluating and trying to make the numbers work. I even went into the contract twice, but got out due to the um, uh, things found during the inspection that they weren't acceptable and I wasn't able to get the uh, necessary credit for them. In general, uh, syndication seemed a much more viable option because number one, uh, the numbers work. Obviously not on all of them, but uh, the ones I considered at the time seemed to work for me. Also, what I realized that um, syndication, investing in syndication was a still is um, a lot more hands-off than any other passive investments, investing as people call it, for instance, a lot of folks consider turnkey investing as a passive. I don't think it's completely or as passive as syndication, mainly because when you invest in a turnkey, and for those that don't know, it means that this turnkey provider um, offers you a single family house, you buy it from them, and then they place a property management to manage it. And you were supposedly just collecting the check. Believe it or not, when there are repairs or breakages or uh, like some large checks that need to be paid, property managers will call you. And then at other times, if they don't know how you want to proceed with certain things, then the property managers will do things the way they're used to doing and that may not align with your strategy. And um, it's always uh, important to stay on top of them and follow up, have periodic calls, know how they treat your tenants, how they maintain your properties to make sure that everything is well maintained. Where in syndications, when you invest in a syndication, the moment you sign the documents and wire the funds, after that, your work is done and you literally just sit back, relax and um, watch for the updates and watch for your distribution checks uh, when they're supposed to come in. There is nothing else that you as an equity partner, passive investor is supposed to do. So that's, to me, that's a huge difference. And that is truly passive because once you invest in the project, your work is done. For sure. Now, thinking back to that time, when you first learned about syndications and the numbers seemed maybe comparable to what you would be achieving with a regular rental, did it cross your mind that um, this is too good to be true? Um, and if not, um, you know, well, if not, we can go somewhere else. But I'm curious if that was on your mind. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm a skeptic by nature. So yes, it did cross my mind that it could that it potentially can be too good to be true. Um, and so my research involved doing um, a, a lot of follow ups, speaking with a lot of existing um, passive investors that I was able to find on bigger pockets um, in a huge family of the community. And I've been really active in the past. Uh, so I talked to a lot of people and then um, I also found a way to connect with the past investor or the syndicator that I invested with um, as my first investment. It, he made a small mistake, which I took advantage of. So basically um, at that time, I guess, uh, mailing lists through MailChimp and other marketing platforms was not an option or was not as popular. So Instead of BCCing his investors, he CC'd everyone. And I took advantage of it by emailing every single person on that list and asking to connect and talk about the experience with the person. Um, so a couple of people responded and that 
actually was the uh, turning point for me uh, to invest with this person because they gave a, a really good positive feedback about the operator themselves. So his mistake turned to his advantage essentially. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. So as a skeptic, getting into this space, what else did you, I mean, obviously you, you know, were able to reach out to other investors of a sponsor, which is tremendously valuable information because, you know, oftentimes a sponsor will make sure to give you a positive reference if they do give you a reference. Um, but what else did you do and what did you learn along that path as far as how to, you know, like decide to make an investment and, and what sort of lessons would you share with the listeners? Thank you. Great question, Suja. So um, I am a huge believer of the constant learning. Uh, even now, I'm always learning something new every single day uh, about various things, that, whether it's real estate or personal development or things that interest me in general. And so with the syndication investments, uh, I have learned a lot with the first one. And I have learned a ton more over the years and while investing in the second, third and so forth syndications. And um, after accumulating that knowledge, I would say that uh, there are three essential steps when evaluating a project. Um, and I, I just want to clarify, the project can mean a lot of things. Um, it can mean a single project or as in the case of um, our, our group, TF Management Group, which is a real estate fund management company, it could mean a fund that invests in other people's deals. So the first and foremost, uh, you have to uh, evaluate the sponsor or uh, the fund manager or the syndicator, whoever you are potentially planning to deal with. Yeah, you, you need to uh, check the background, learn more about their track record, history of operations, how they performed in the past. Uh, definitely talk to them, uh, see if you can get any references and recommendation. And while you know there are privacy concerns, you, that can also happen by checking the potential um, re audio recordings of the recommendations many people have not written but the audio recordings that they post either on their website or uh, on their professional profiles on some of the social media platforms. See what other people say about the operator and talk to them, ask questions. And by the way, I have a list of questions that I've developed over time um, that passive investors can ask a deal sponsor. So if you uh, would like your listeners to get that, uh, let me know, I'm happy to share that list with you. Absolutely. And so, uh, so that's step number one. So first, talk to the operator, see if their strategy and their overall approach aligns with your beliefs, with your long-term plans, and whether uh, this is a person that you feel confident you will be able to build a rapport with, and you're confident to pass your money to. So that's step number one. Once you pass this step, the next step, if it's a single deal, then evaluate the markets where they invest. For example, let's say it's an apartment complex uh, that they're buying and let's say they're buying it in DFW. So look at the DFW fundamentals. Does the market have um, the infrastructure that supports buying more apartment complexes there? Is there uh, so, you know, lower supply and higher demand for apartments of this specific class in the area. Um, what are the major employers in, in the area? Do they attract more people? Are the people still coming into the area? Is the population growing? And then uh, also when you look at the major employers, are they there to stay? Uh, make sure they're not going to be replaced by the next Amazons tomorrow. It's not, you know, it, it, let's say uh, you have a hospital or a major university, places or a manufacturing plant that will definitely stay there and um, will continue attracting more labor into the area. So things like that need to be looked. And then the last and final step is to evaluate the deal itself. And when you look at the deal itself, again, whether it's a fund or an individual deal, always look at the two components. Look at the quantitative and qualitative components and try to align them. See if they tell you a story. So 
for example, um, going back to that DFW apartment complex, um, let's say that the offering memorandum says that we're going to raise the rents by 15%. Well, if it's an um, A or B plus type of area, yeah, most likely you can raise the rents by 15%. But if it's, let's say, D plus or C minus area, uh, how realistic is it to raise the rents by the you know this high percentage? Can the people in that area afford paying uh, rents that are so much higher than the existing ones? Is it realistic? And I'm not necessarily saying that it's not, but uh, it needs to be verified. And it means for you to do your own due diligence and also ask the operator questions so that you can better understand how they're thinking of um, making this happen. And maybe they will be able to raise the rents by 15%, but maybe it will not happen uh, over the period of one year, rather it will last three years. And so uh, look at the underwriting that they're sharing in the offering memorandum. Um, in addition to rents, also look at the expenses. If let's say they're saying we're gonna lower expenses by 10%, uh, see what they're doing. Are they implementing rubs? Are they potentially um, putting the maybe just electric charge or water charge back on the tenants if it's not in the tenants yet? So essentially look at the proposed strategy and if something doesn't make sense, ask operator the questions. And while you're asking questions, also watch how they answer and what they tell you. Do the answers make sense? And do the answers align with a proposed strategy that is detailed in the offering memorandum. And that will help you to put the pieces of the story together and see whether the deal in fact does make sense for you. And then um, last but not least, what's also important, look at the risk uh, risks associated with this project. Um, ask the operator how they're planning to mitigate these risks and if anything comes up, uh, what is their plan? What, what is their strategy to uh, mitigate or avoid risks altogether? And then compare that with your own risk profile. If that matches your risk profile, if you're comfortable with the, the level of risk they're planning to implement, then uh, by all means move forward. But if not, then as the deal and find another one. There are plenty of deals out there. And uh, by networking and talking to other people, you can find um, a, a lot of projects. So if one doesn't fit your profile, don't just jump on it because the numbers will do. Always, always evaluate and decide if, whether it makes sense. If not, then find another project or a fund for yourself. Awesome. Well, I hope you all were taking notes or go back and listen to it and because there is so much um, useful information, applicable things that you can do to get comfortable with the deal. Um, thank you so much for that, Alina. And before we wrap up, I'd love to get your take. You know, you've been now doing this for a little bit, helping people invest. What are the primary reasons why people um, either A, decide to invest or a keep them from really getting started in syndications? I think uh, part of the reason that people do not get started investing in syndication is the mindset, their limiting belief. Uh, um, as we talked earlier, Suja, it's, uh, people think that it's too good to be true, then it most likely is. In some cases, that's the case, and in some cases, it's not. Um, and then when you're looking at the returns, always keep in mind that you have to look not only at the numbers, but you have to look at the return on your time in addition to the return on the investment. How much time do you put in and how much you get out of this? In the case of syndications, it's uh, very similar to the stock market investing. Once you put the money in, then you essentially rely on the stock market. The main difference between stock market investing and syndication investing is in stock market, it's like throwing a dart in the dark. You don't really know how that stock will behave. With syndications, you get the projections. The operator or the fund manager tells you, we anticipate getting this return and that is based on an extensive analysis, quantitative analysis, mind you, and in addition to the qualitative, that tells us this is what we project and that's what we expect to get. And in a lot of cases, 
uh, the uh, operators are able to follow those projections again because they've put their efforts into making it happen and because they have the successful track record of executing it. So back to your question, um, people typically start because either they have passed that limiting beliefs point or they have someone close to them who, whom they trust who told them, yes, I worked with this operator, you can move forward. Um, another way or a way to pass the limits and beliefs is to educate yourself. For instance, in my case, um, I started by reading books, listening to podcasts, talking to people, and all of that helped. It's just, it's not one source of information, it's multiple, but when you absorb it and when you don't understand something, ask questions, it helps you to, to get educated. And when you're educated, it helps you make informed decisions. And when you're informed, it helps you pass that limiting beliefs of your mindset. That awesome. That makes a lot of sense. I really like how you explain that, Alina. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It's been such a treat to have you and hear your story and um, words of wisdom. There's so much there. So everyone, um, please reach out. Alina, will you please give us a way for the listeners to get in touch with you or anything else that you'd like to share? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I will share with you the um, list of questions that uh, your investors can ask either an operator or a fund manager. Um, in terms of uh, reaching out to me, they can email me at alina at tempofunding.com. It's T-E-M-P-O funding.com. Um, or they can find me on LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, I hope you all take some time to reach out to Alina. And thank you so much again for coming on. Can't wait to see what's going on with you in, um, you know, the next time you're on the show. Thanks again. Thank you.